read uh, God's Word here publicly. Um, a lot of people read God's Word every day a lot, but they don't want to do it in front of everybody. So <laughs> we're all a little different, right? Uh, before I start, I forgot, Joan Myrick is also mending. I'm going to go see her today after our community phase. She had a hip replacement. She's doing pretty well, going through the therapy. And some of you know about, uh, <laughs> I'm looking at Janine there, it's had quite a few surgeries lately. Uh, most people that have these surgeries say the surgery itself, you know, you're all drugged up. That's pretty easy. But then the next six, seven, eight weeks uh, recovering, that, that's a tough time. So anyway, keep Joan in, in our prayers. God bless her. <clears throat> Grace and peace from God our Father, the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> As I've uh, aged, um, in some ways I find solitary moments easier than when I was younger. Uh, in other ways, it's more difficult. Uh, I remember, <clears throat> you've, you've heard me say, uh, when I was 19, I was hired as a director of a camp. I put it in air quotes because my dear friend, Pastor Munner, who was the one that did the wedding for Schnett and me, uh, hired me, not sure why, because uh, I was a sophomore in college and he was gonna go down to the seminary and interview people. But he says, well, John, if, if you want the job, you got it. So uh, <laughs> uh, I was kind of, and my friend Eddie Wigman taught me how to play guitar that summer. And, you know, I kind of uh, was learning things as I went along. But anyway, <clears throat> I was there a couple different summers. And if you've been to Ohio or any state back there, a lot more people. Towns are closer. Uh, I, I remember we thought when we played Louisville in sports, it was... 30 miles away, it took 40 minutes. We couldn't imagine how long that was to get all the way to Louisville. And then I come here <laughs> and I find out how far things really are to play the next local team, you know. You might go all the way to Spokane or Tri-Cities and who knows where else you're gonna go. <clears throat> so we get a little different perspective of that. But anyway, pretty much everywhere in Ohio you can hear cars or trucks. And Camp Frederick was just 10 miles from where I grew up. It was near a town called Rogers, Ohio. And there was about 80 acres there. Mr. Frederick gave it to uh, the churches. My hometown pastor kind of arranged that deal. Uh, the churches ended up paying $1 for this land. And Mr. Frederick, he used to come down to the camp, I remember. At the time, he was elderly, probably 74. No, I think he was, I think he was in his 80s. And, and we had a cat, and we named the cat Fred, Frederick, for Mr. Frederick. He just loved to hear, he was from Youngstown, he loved to hear the sounds of the kids playing. Well, and I was around the sounds of kids a lot, so one of the things I looked forward to was a quiet place, and there was this little spot way upstream, it's called, we call it the outpost camp. It was probably a mile and a half from the lodge, and it was the only place that I knew around where I grew up where you could wait for like 10 minutes and you wouldn't hear a car. It's like living here, you know, <laughs> about every hour or two. I mean, I've walked, I, I do more biking than walking because my knees, but I remember I've walked, one time I ended up walking to Roger's house because I thought Jerry was going to pick me up, but he was already there. And <laughs> I was only two hours late, Roger. So anyway, I remember walking from here up to the top of the hill, past the Wiggins, down to the bottom and back up, and you know how many cars disturbed me? Zero. <laughs> and I did it again, zero, and the next time I did it, one car, and I said, I've got to move out of here, it's too much traffic, you know. But I remember that outpost camp because I would find solitary moments there, and I could, I could hear the creek, and that was it. And that became a place of prayer for me in my young life, 19, 20, uh, when I was there, and that was really important to me. I remember, at camp, we would get the kids toward evening, and, and this, this is uh, in memorial to my friend Rick Brown, who passed on about two years ago. Uh, I hired Rick that second summer, and he was at camp council. He had hair, uh, about, about a, val about a uh, Valente hair, a little longer, before Valente got his hair cut, if you've seen him lately. But anyway, he, uh, he was a great singer. And when I stood next to Rick, I wasn't bad. I mean, he would harmonize, and I just, you know, it was like, I'm pretty good. When Rick would walk away, I thought, oh, boy. <laughs> but we would sing this song he wrote or he knew. It was called Build Your House, kind of a slow, melodic song. And we would go upstream a little bit, and then probably 
you know, across the hill, it was hilly in that part of Ohio, there was a cross, not, not as big as ours, say half as big, and we had these uh, torches, kerosene soaked torches, so we put three of them so you could see the cross in that night, and we'd get these city kids in there, and Rick and I would sing, build your house on Christ the solid rock and not on sand. And I remember every time we did it, we captured those kids because a lot of them had never experienced kind of solitary moments like that. And we didn't say too much, but you could see the cross, you could hear the creek, you could hear Rick harmonizing and hopefully put up with me. And it was just a special spiritual time. And some of these kids later said, I remember down at Camp Frederick when you and Rick would sing, build your house on Christ, the solid rock and not on sand. Um, Jesus sets the pace here. So as, as Roger read in Mark 1, uh, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place. Seems like we, we run into that verse at least once a year. And what do you notice from that particular passage? He got up early. Now, for you farmers, how many of you farmers through the years have gotten up while it was still dark? especially in the winter, right? <laughs> yeah, or Scotty working. <laughs> you know, and, and so you get up, you go to work, uh, or maybe you were a nurse or whatever. I used to get up pretty early, but yeah, I'm getting some looks. <laughs> I don't get up early much anymore, but, but he got up early in the morning. This is Jesus. He got up, he left the house, and he went off to a solitary place. Now, for him, that often was up on a mountain. There, there were some stories where he went out into a boat. But he went to a solitary place where he, Jesus, prayed. Now, some might say, why would Jesus pray? I mean, he is Jesus. Well, we don't fully know or understand how Jesus came into the fullness of God. Remember, he was born of Mary, a virgin, and he... he, he he was God's son, but from what we can tell, he, he kind of picked that up along the way. He, you know, he taught when he was 12 years old in the temple. I mean, I'm sure he knew at a young age there was something special here, but you, you know what I mean? We don't really know. We are not Jesus. So apparently even Jesus needed to go and pray to God the Father. That would be in the creed, you know, God the Father. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so he would pray. Now, <clears throat> before, this is, this is like Mark 1. You know, this is like the first chapter of Mark. And we know from other Gospels that he was doing stuff before that. Healing, helping people, laying on hands, changing lives. And so Simon and his companions went to look for him. Now, I don't know <clears throat> how busy some of you are, but some of you farmers, if you worked in an office, worked in a church, and you were in charge of something, even, even if in your own household. Dad, Dad, or I'll go, Shanette, where did I put that? <laughs> where did I put that bill for? Where are my keys, honey? You know, it seems like there's always somebody we're, we're saying, help, help. And so they're saying, they came, everybody is looking for you. You know, if you're the mother of these uh, seven kids on Sounds Like Rain, the group, I'm sure they had time, you know. Oh, where were you, Dad? You got seven kids here looking for you. Well, I was out praying by myself. And you, you kind of get a sense of that. Jesus needed to separate himself, and he prayed. And when they found him, what, it, it, they said, everybody's looking for you. Now, why was everybody looking for Jesus? Can, can you just think in your mind, why were they looking for him? Well, best I can tell, he had just been performing miracles, great acts of love and kindness, healing people. And people were telling their relatives, you got to see this man. He's the real thing. And so the disciples got up a little later. Let's say Jesus got up. We'll put a time on it. Four. Disciples got up, let's say, at six. And by seven, where's Jesus? There's people that need you. And, and Jesus replied, and, and you've heard me preach on this before because it comes around. Uh, to me, one of the shocking moments. I remember as a kid reading it. It was shocking to me. I thought Jesus... Could Jesus have this wrong? I remember thinking. He said, let us go somewhere else. So what do you mean somewhere else? We got people here. We got people that need you. We got relatives that heard about you. They want, to, they want their kids healed. How could you say go somewhere else? Well, 
And what we're going to talk about a little today is our lives need to focus on the essential and not always on the immediate. And now for you and for me, it's a little easier or harder to discern what's essential. You know, how do you figure out in your life and my life what is most essential? For Jesus, I think by this time it was a little easier. He said, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages. So around here, you know, bad enough at lacrosse, we're going to go to Pampa Pond or over to Benj or, you know, Colfax, whatever this, down to Pomeroy, <laughs> wherever you might be, hey, Dusty, uh, Colfax, let us go somewhere else so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. I mean, that's pretty powerful when you think about it. He had been healing. What, what could be more powerful than healing and doing all the things that he had done? And Jesus in that moment, now why would he have said that? Did he just come up with that by himself in a vision? It doesn't say exactly, but for my mind, Jesus got up early in the morning and went off to pray. And what do you think happened? My best guess is he was communing, communicating with God. And God who told him, you need to preach over here. You can't deal with all the immediate needs of everybody in the world. You're only here for a while. You know, I, uh, uh, John uh, Gordon back there just kind of was helping me think through this thing about visiting Jake and correctly said, you know, Arlene and I, it wasn't our idea. It was like God convicted us that it's time to go see Jake. And I looked at them and I thought, God wants us to go see Jake. So we went and saw Jake and it became his last supper, his last communion. I don't take credit, John or Arlene don't take credit, but we were at least quiet enough to hear God. Somehow God came through, you, me, we drove, we got there, and we found a moment. So what God wanted Jesus to do was to preach the gospel. That is why I have come. Now I've found that helpful as a minister because not so much here. <laughs> But, you know, when I was pastor, let's say in Prescott, there were about 1,300 members. We averaged 600 a Sunday. That's a lot of people. And, and so the phone rang a lot. And I remember Marie, who was a, a bit of an Italian, a little excitable and fun. And I, I, I teased her. I shouldn't have. After she had printed off the bulletin, I'd say, Marie, can you get one more thing in there? Get out of here. Get out of here. She'd say, <laughs> Get out of here. The bulletin's done. You, know? uh, you got to have fun with these things. But then I would back off for a couple of weeks. But people looking for you, and people will look for you. I don't care who you are. There's some people that are going to be looking for you, but we want to focus in on our mission in life. So the end of that was he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So preaching and the demons, casting out of demons. That's a lot of people have these evil spirits. Now, his understanding of, uh, oh, here's my pen. <laughs> Shanette says, your mind just goes this way and that way, doesn't it? <laughs> I knew I had this pen. <laughs> uh, one of the guys at the coffee, well, they call it the coffee group, he made this, got a cross on there. You see that? I've managed to keep that for five years, which for me is remarkable. But anyway, uh, so he prayed that his father's purposes uh, would be uh, in his life. So Jesus came to accomplish a specific mission. So how about you and me? Knowing our mission in life helps us to clarify daily commitment. How do you know, how do I know what God wants us to do? Well, that's not easy. I mean, I can say, yeah, pray. Pray about it. Get some alone time and pray about it. And that's true. It's not untrue. But how do you really talk to yourself with God? I mean, you know, I'm a little strange, and uh, you, you, you know, <laughs> you hired me anyway, you know. But my, when I, you know, th this isn't, you know, I think of Jake smirking at me when I talk. This wasn't a bike trip like the bike trip, but sometimes when I'm out biking, I'll be talking to somebody or listening. But I'll, and this, I've mentioned this before, but I'll literally say, okay, John, you need to talk to yourself just a little bit. And I will talk out loud about, I'll say, okay, John. What, 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 what's your purpose right now? What, what's God calling you to do? So a little, I mean, it's weird. If somebody heard me, they'd think he has a demon that caps out. You know, I'm talking. But for whatever reason in my life, when I've done that, I could get to the core because there's no use to lie when you're talking to yourself. You know, you might fudge a little bit with your kids or with your wife or with the preacher, but 
It's like, okay, you get the mirror. I don't look at the mirror. That's too much. But I just say, okay, John, let's talk. Let's talk about your life and what's important. And sometimes when I do that, it's like, yeah, I've, I've kind of forgotten about this aspect of life, and it helps straighten it out. Uh, I cannot say, and, and I don't think God can say exactly how you will do it, but I believe that God is telling us that we have a mission and we need to refine our thinking and our praying so we can do that over and above other things. Like Jesus, uh, we will get bogged down on other things that are good and what God is calling us, calling us to do uh, the essential. So, so I wanted to mention that. But keeping it to the basics... Uh, my son, Keaton, who, who lives in uh, Phoenix, you know, uh, he, he never made the basketball team or anything. I was an average high school player, you know, uh, and, I, and I, I was pretty basic. I mean, I didn't do a lot of the razzle-dazzle uh, stuff, but, but as I got older, I, I was pretty good at throwing the ball behind my back. And so I just did that with Keaton, and he would scold me, Dad. Just the basics, you know. <laughs> you don't need this, you know, you're too old for that anyway. Throw it behind your back. That was the one thing I could do. It's the basics, so keep to the, so that was good. And, we, and we've talked about that in real life because he'll talk to me about something and he'll, sometimes he'll say, Dad, how about the basics? You know, what are you doing here at your church? And, and it's hard to know exactly, but I think God is calling us to find out what our basics are in, in our lives. Uh, we have prayer back there. Who's ever here? Ushers. And, and I always pick on Nick Kohler because uh, he, he almost is apologetic. But a lot of times he'll talk about the basics. He's, you know, we thank you, God, for, you know, food, water, shelter. And sometimes, and, and, and Jeanette always gets on me if I say political. So it's not political. I'll just say that sometimes there are smoke screens out there that talk about all kinds of issues, which I would say maybe aren't basic. How about... You know, and I've mentioned before, uh, since the year 2000, uh, 2 billion people have, have come out of absolute poverty for a number of reasons. Two, in, that, in other words, they're not, and, 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 and the degree of absolute poverty, this is sad to think about it, is $2 a day or more. I mean, that's a pretty low bar. So you're living somewhere in Asia or Africa or somewhere. You at least have some food and some clean water. Those are the basic. Seems to me that important figures, people, would rejoice in some of the basic. People now have clean water. They have food to eat. That's important. But we hear about other things that, in my judgment, are not so important. And, and we lose fact, uh, the, the fact that people are being helped in a number of ways. So anyway, so Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. So what do we do? when there's challenging time. And this gets us to the second letter, I guess it was the first one that Roger read, number one, was that Psalm, Psalm 77. And thank you, Roger, for reading that. But this is an example of, you know, how do you focus when things are going badly? And from Psalm uh, 77, we read, will the Lord reject forever? This is the psalmist. Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? This is a guy that's really dumb. Has his promise failed for all time, says the psalmist? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Have you ever felt like that? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? I mean, this is real stuff. That's why Luther just loved the psalm, because he said they're so real. They're just right in the, you know, they're honest. They're... God, I'm mad at you. Why is this happening? You know, 40 of the 150 Psalms are laments. Why this and why that? It's real stuff. But within this one Psalm, we get a transition. But then, and I'm thinking about God. And he says, Then I thought, to this I will appeal, writes the psalmist. The years of the right hand of the Most High, I will remember the deeds of God, thinking back to what God has done. Yes, I remember your miracles of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider all of your mighty deeds. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is as great as our God, he says. You are the God who performs miracles. You display power among the peoples. With his mighty arm, you redeem your people. It's like, wow, that was a change of heart. That's why I encourage people basics. The sun rose this morning. 
That's a good thing. Uh, it's going to set tonight, I believe. That's a good thing. We don't get much rain around here, but when it rains, we are greatly blessed and we are so grateful. And sometimes we forget the really big picture and how blessed we are. We live here in, you know, a little more of a remote place. As my son says, two hour round trip to Starbucks. That's how he describes it. <laughs> All the way to Pullman. But what blessings we have. And every once in a while when I'm visiting, young or old, I was talking to somebody I didn't know very well. It was maybe 90. and spent her whole life here. And she said, you know, I don't have any regrets that I never went anywhere else. This, is, this has been this is a great place to live. And I've been so blessed by the people around this area. And so my call, my hope, and my prayer for all of us is that we find more solitary moments. I've mentioned time and time again that Martin Luther had said it was, it was a particular busy day. You've heard me say this many times. What did he do? He'd get up an hour earlier to pray more. Me, I would get, you know, on my worst times, I'd get right to the minute, get the sleep, and then get up and try to handle it, which is not a good way to do it, John, but sometimes I try it that way. Luther also said, without prayer, a life without prayer, is no more possible than being alive without breathing. When we breathe our last, what happens? We're, we're gone. We're deceased. We're dead. When we aren't praying at all, when we don't have any solitary moments, we become dead or dying inside. And God calls us to be alive in him. So think about Jesus. Everybody was asking for him. He got a message from God. He said, no, we need to go this way. My prayer for all of you is think about your life. You don't have to be strange like me and have self-talk, but be honest with yourself. What is my mission? If you say to yourself, I have no mission, there's no purpose in my life, I'm going to boldly say, you're wrong. Because I thought that about me, and people in my life have said, John, you're wrong. You, you have something to do. And I've known people at every age, 105, 98, uh, elderly, sick people who still have a mission in Jesus Christ. So we find these solitary moments in Jesus' name.